In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time a prayer fruitful, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. In the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord Jesus Christ addresses his audience in a very striking way, talking to his followers, to those listeners there in the hillside of Galilee. Jesus says the following, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The salt of the earth, the light of the world, Talk about a self-esteem boost to hear these words from our Lord. That those people, those ordinary people, those crowds, were called to play essential roles in the world, in the history of the world. We know that salt is absolutely essential for any sort of cooking. Almost every dish or every meal, at least, has some salt in it. And there are certain things, of course, that without salt are completely unpalatable. People actually make unsalted potato chips. Personally, I think there should be some sort of UN resolution against such a thing. It's just terribly unappetizing. But this is what Jesus is telling us, and he's telling those followers of his, You're the salt of the earth. Without you, the earth is like a meal without salt. Like food without that flavor that salt gives it. Without that preservative, too. In the ancient world, salt was was used very much as a preservative for fish and meats. Keeping it from rotting. Letting it still be edible. And then light. You are the light of the world. In the ancient world, of course, light was limited to daylight. And people would get up, more or less, when the sun rose. And then when the sun went down, well, they were, they were really hampered in their activity. Obviously, there was no electricity. Wax for candles was very expensive. Oil for lamps was expensive. And so most people just had to rest and sleep and wait for the next day in order to get moving again. And it was dangerous on the roads because there were no lights. And so to say you are the light of the world is really to compare them to the sun, which gives life to all living things, lets people see everything else. Our Lord in the Gospel of John compares himself precisely to the light. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. As in another place, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The essential meaning to our life is found in Christ. The truth of our life. The light of our life, the meaning of our life is found in Jesus Christ. And so he says, I am the light of the world. But then turning to us, turning to Christians, he says, you are the light of the world. You are me in the world. You are me for the world. What a tremendous vocation the Christian vocation is. 
to be salt, to be light, Lord, to represent you, to be you for the world. When we really need someone and we want to recognize their importance to us, we might ask them, where would I be without you? Or we might say, I'd be lost without you. And in a way, this is the world without Christians who are truly Christians, who truly believe, who truly follow our Lord. Lost without us because they're lost without Christ, like sheep without a shepherd, as our Lord describes those crowns. In the early church, there's a beautiful letter, a work of apologetics called The Letter to Diognetus. And in there, the author is explaining Christianity to a non-Christian. And he says this, To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body, as the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it. So Christians are found in all the cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world, but their religious life remains unseen. Right? Their their being in the state of grace, their relationship with God, is something that's invisible. It's a matter of faith. It's invisible to us as well. Their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and wars against it, not because of any injury the soul has done it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Similarly, the world hates Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. Christians love those who hate them just as the soul loves the body and all its members, despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul, enclosed within the body, that the body is held together. And similarly, it is by the Christians, detained in the world as if in a prison, that the world is held together. It is by Christians that the world is held together. It is by Christians that the world is enlivened with the light of Christ, with the life of Christ. And so, Lord, we can see if the world is sick, and it is sick in so many ways. If the world is lost, and it is lost in so many ways. Well, we have to look at ourselves and say, well, am I being truly a Christian? Am I living my faith? Am I worshiping God with a full heart? Am I trusting God in those things that that test my trust? Am I reaching out to others? Am I living the golden rule to love others as I love myself and the new commandment to love others as Christ loves me? Am I being the light of the world? Am I trying to spread the faith? Or is my faith something just for my own private practice, something that helps me to cope with my problems, my life, and I keep it kind of hid. I don't put my light on that lampstand. I hide it away. And if that's the case, Lord, well then, really, it's not really faith. Lord Jesus, our faith in you is the good news, the Evangelium. And the Evangelium is a proclamation of deliverance, something that saves me. My faith in you, Lord Jesus, is something that always is active in my soul, active in my life. It's saving me from sin, freeing me for conversion, freeing me for faith, hope, and charity. And if it's not news, well, then it's not faith. And and if I'm not spreading it, well, then it's not news. If I'm not spreading my faith, at least by my example, but also by my conversations, my friendships, well then how much do I really believe? It ceased to be the gospel for me. It ceased to be something urgent that's, that has saved me and causes me to reach out and try to save others. 
It's become something else, perhaps an ideology, perhaps just a way of life among many others. But it's no longer what it truly is. Light that I need to see in this darkness. A lifeline that I need to grab onto in this in this tempest of the world. Truly salvation. St. Maria writes in the Forge, We are children of God, bearers of the only flame that can light up the paths of the earth for souls, of the only brightness which can never be darkened, dimmed, or overshadowed. The Lord uses us as torches to make that light shine out. It depends on us that many should not remain in darkness, but walk instead along paths that lead to eternal life. Striking a similar note as you, Lord, in the Sermon on the Mount, Light of the World, bearers are the only flame that can light up the paths of the earth for souls. It depends on us that many should not remain in darkness, but walk instead along paths that lead to eternal life. Lord, you're counting on us. You're counting on us, Lord, to be true believers, to be true Christians. To be united, perhaps that's so important these days. Right? Not to get not to get caught up in anything that divides us as Catholics, or even as even as Christians. There's too much good to do, there's too much work to be done. There's too much faith and hope to spread, to fall into divisions over anything, to fall into liturgical quarrels, to fall into interpretations of history which obscure our faith and don't trust the magisterium of the church, Vatican councils, for example. Lord, help us not take our, take our eyes off the ball. You look at that crowd and you look at us and you say, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And if we're just looking at ourselves and fighting each other and being frightened by all sorts of theories and counter theories, how much good are, how much good are we doing? How much am I really living my faith? How much faith do I have if I'm full of fear about this or that account or this or that liturgical practice, this or that decision, this or that way of doing things. Help my faith be much stronger than that, Lord. This is your church, one holy, Catholic, apostolic, Roman, founded on Peter and on his successors. Lord, give me a love for the Pope and a unity that goes beyond any opinions that I may have or points of view I may have, however valid they may seem to me. There's a much bigger, <laughs> bigger game to play, a bigger mission that we have than to waste our time infighting. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And in a way, Lord, I should be excited about the difficulties in the world and even the difficulties in the church. Anytime there's difficulties in the church, anytime there's difficulties in the world, it's also a moment of great grace. This is how God works. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And if we look at all the crises in the history of the church, they're accompanied by God's response by giving people giving people insights and charisms and holiness to help others and to rejuvenate the church. In the first centuries of Christianity, when the church was persecuted by Rome, well, what do we have? We have hundreds of martyrs, great witnesses of the faith who win, who win grace for the whole history of the church. Because the martyr says with his blood, this is how real Christ is for me. This is how real God is for me. I know that Jesus died for me, so I'm going to die for him. They witness with their blood, with their death, as to the truth of the faith, the radical nature of salvation in Christ. 
And then in the dark ages, Rome falls and collapses and collapses. And Europe is subjected to those barbarian invasions. And during that time of collapse, we have these great saints, St. Augustine, and later the great missionary saints, St. Patrick, St. Anselm. And then in the Reformation, right, that great rebellion against church unity, a cautionary tale for our own time, where many Christians lost their faith and were losing their way in a, a period of great secularization. God was taken out of culture and out of the public life of, of nations. We have, at the same time, great graces poured into individuals and communities. St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Francis Xavier, St. Charles Borromeo, St. Pius V. They're wonderful saints who God raised up to sanctify the church, to help the world, to be the light of the world during difficult times. The 20th century and into our own age, right? 20th century, terrible time of bloody persecution of the church. The world torn apart by those world wars. The communist ideology causing tremendous damage both to bodies and to souls. And at the same time, there were saints, many saints. St. John Paul II, St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Edith Stein, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, St. Jose Maria, so many more. And so now in our own time, Lord, we're facing division in the church, we're facing ideologies of different sorts. And with the eyes of faith, we have to kind of like start looking around and saying, there's a lot of grace here. It's time for me really to live my faith. It's time for me to take advantage of the teachings of the church and the teachings of the gospel and God's presence in my life to be a Christian, to be light of the world, to be salt of the earth, and in my own way, to be a saint. As St. Josemaria put it very famously, these world crises are crises of saints. These world crises are crises of saints. Precisely the problems in the world are problems that God uses to pour grace into souls who will rise up and handle those problems with him and be salt of the earth and be light of the world. So Lord, help us. Help us not to underestimate the importance of being united, underestimate the importance of just our good effort to be truly Christians, to understand others, to forgive others to be open to dealing with people who think differently, to not hate the world, which at times hates us, but rather to love it, even if that entails some persecution, some difficulty. Help us to see, Lord, you're counting on us to be that soul of the world, salt of the earth, light of the world. St. John Henry Newman has a wonderful prayer that he composed about the Christian vocation. And he put it in a very personal key. He was talking about himself. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told it in the next I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. And I think it's a very important point that he makes here. He says, I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. So we may not know the specific good or the specific reason that we're here, that you know, no one else uh, is here for. But we'll find it out and it's there. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. 
I shall do good, I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, while not intending it, if I do but keep his commandments. Another beautiful way of thinking about our Christian vocation. If we just do what God wants, if we just really try to live in the way that God wants us to live, to keep his commandments, his commandments to forgive, his commandments to love, his commandments to preach, his commandments to trust him, we'll do a lot of good, even if it's hidden. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, while not intending it, if I do but keep his commandments. Therefore, I will trust him. Whatever I am, I can never be thrown away. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. In perplexity, my perplexity may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. He does nothing in vain. He knows what he is about. He may take away my friends. He may throw me among strangers. He may make me feel desolate, make my spirit sink, hide my future from me. Still, he knows what he is about. And this is not something that St. John Henry Newman kind of just wrote up imagining some person who went through difficult times. It's not a theoretical prayer. He had very difficult times in his life. And he was persecuted by friends, and he was let down by people he trusted, and he went through periods of confusion and depression. He had to keep looking for the truth. These are words of a soul who experienced these things. And his solution was to keep going, to have faith that, that God was not playing with his life. He was here for a reason. He couldn't be discarded. And so he'd keep trying to be a Christian, keep living the truth. And in the end, it would work out marvelously because it would work out in the way that God wants. Because he knows what he is about. Lord Jesus, I make an act of faith. In my own Christian vocation, I apply these words to myself, to my own situation. I have my mission. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for nothing. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I will trust him. Whatever I am, I can never be thrown away. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. In perplexity, my perplexity may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. He does nothing in vain. He knows what he is about. He may take away my friends. He may throw me among strangers. He may make me feel desolate, make my spirit sink, hide my future from me still. He knows what he is about. Lord, I will trust you. And I will try to respond, reminding myself that, that it matters. My response matters. Because you, Lord, have called me salt of the earth. You, Lord, have called me light of the world. And so my Christian response, my vocation, really to, to live my faith, not to reduce it to an ideology, not to reduce it to a lifestyle, but to live faith, which means every day Jesus needs to save me from sin and turn me towards conversion. Every day I need to say I'm sorry for the things I do wrong, my lacks of faith, and to begin again and to make a new step towards giving myself and loving others as God loves me and growing in courage and trust to be a light to others, to be an envoy of Christ. Every day, a daily conversion, as St. Jose Maria would say. A life of faith. And not a life of complacency because I'm right. <laughs> or, or a life of self-satisfaction because I think I'm better than others. No, a life of faith in the gospel 
that I need to be freed every day from my sinful self and to turn every day a little bit more into, into another Christ, into our Lord. Much depends on this. St. Josemaria puts it this way in the way. He says, Many great things depend, don't forget it, on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. Many great things depend, don't forget it, on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. So Lord, don't let me get distracted. Don't let me get distracted by controversy. Don't let me get uh, distracted by a great fear that can take over my life. What are people going to think? How's the world going to treat me? Don't let me get distracted, Lord, by my own personal theories or opinions. Lord, help me to keep my eye on the ball. Many great things depend, don't forget it, on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. And this will be the happier life for us. We go to Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Blessed means happy. And she's happy because she's trusting her Lord and she's out of herself. And she runs the risk of loving and living a life of abandonment in God. And so we go to her, Blessed Virgin Mary, Virgin most faithful, you who trusted God and his judgment more than your own judgment and gave everything to him. Help us to be happy in the way that you are happy by responding fully and faithfully to our Christian vocation. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.